Okay, so uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn and we'll... <laughs> anyway, good. I, I think this uh, sets, the, uh, sets the field and we're ready to go into it. As I said, the, the, our, our hope here is to have a volume that is forward looking. Uh, I learned when I got into the world of uh, educational testing and assessment uh, back in approximately 1986 or 87 thereabouts that um, it is absolutely essential to understand the historical context for contemporary debates about these tools, these methods, these measures, these metrics. Uh, I had the great good fortune of working with people like Carl Kasel and others way back then. And I've remembered that and I have insisted for my own work that whenever I get involved in a project having to do with uh, issues about the future of educational testing and for that matter other aspects of education, I like to have a historian nearby uh, to make sure that I'm not doing what many people do is imagine that this stuff is new and we've never, we've never had this before. And if you, if you live in, I mean, I live in Washington, which is, I know you can send me sympathy cards at some point, but I get to go to meetings and it's, it's really quite poignant in some ways to see younger folks involved in issues related to education policy who hear about things like test-based accountability and who say, wow, that's a cool idea. Let's try that. And I always feel like, OK, let's, let's see if we can just hit the pause button briefly and think about the, the historical context and uh, place these, these debates in, in that kind of context. So uh, with that, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first panel, um, starting with uh, a very distinguished historian and a member of the National Academy of Education. Uh, our dear friend Maris Vinovskis, who has written this paper about primarily the K-12 aspects of the history of education and testing. And that will be followed by our wonderful colleague, uh, Mike Nettles, who will be talking about the history uh, and uses of uh, testing at the, at the post, in the post-secondary uh, context. So 18 minutes each, guys. And uh, Amy, I work with Amy, and I can tell you uh, we are disciplined with the time, timekeeping. So Maris and um, I guess Maris and Doug is going to be the discussant. Mike Nettles, come on up and why don't we all just sit up here together. Um, uh, we're very grateful to, um, to Doug from Georgetown University and Bill Trent from the University of Illinois uh, who have agreed to be discussants. Um, and let's uh, get this road on the show, so to speak. So, Maris, you're the lead-off hitter. Thank you. One of the problems of writing about the past is that there are a lot of different things that come up. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about is not only assessment, but also the context, which is very important, of understanding what people expect of education and who should control uh, the education of, their, of our children. Uh, and looking at this subject, one of the things that was very disappointing is that nobody has done an overview. People have done certain parts of it, but there are also large gaps, and, and this is something actually that needs a lot more work. And so my task is to summarize 400 years of our history and education, uh, uh, testing and assessment, and I've divided it into colonial and 19th century America, 1900 to 1960, and 1960 to 216. And uh, the paper uh, deals with it in, in varying uh, degrees. Uh, looking at colonial 19th century education, most, most of the Europeans settling colonial America were Protestants, and they believed that everybody should be able to read the Bible. So it has a very strong religious background uh, from the very beginning. Parents are responsible for teaching their own children literacy, though sometimes they could uh, rely upon widows to teach young children, uh, which were very uh, uh, handy and convenient. 
After the American Revolution, common schools rapidly expanded, and even some high schools, I think we've underestimated the extent of high schools uh, in the antebellum period, especially in the North and in the Midwest. Before the Civil War, many African-American children attended segregated Northern schools or learned to read elsewhere. And the activities of free uh, African-Americans in the North in education has also been underestimated. The South tends to lag in all of these areas, uh, both in terms of uh, white edu uh, whites being educated and especially in terms of African-Americans. Most African-Americans in antebellum America are slaves in, in the South, and they are anything but welcome to learn to, to read or write. Outside the few larger cities, most parents sent their kids to small rural schools. Usually these are one-room schools, assembled all the boys and girls that were uh, uh, of all ages in, in one setting. Education reformers like Horace Mann advocated tra hiring trained teachers and using the same textbooks in the classrooms, but they lacked the power to do so. So it's a, a large question is who decides what needs to be done uh, in terms of these activities. The public insisted that local parents, rather than educators, should decide where children attended school, which teachers were hired, and what books were used. And this gets into the debates that we have today, who is responsible for education. Most students attended a public common school, which taught students basic subjects such as reading, writing, and arithmetic. The end of the school year usually was celebrated with a public exhibition which displayed orally the skills acquired by their students. We have forgotten what we really in intended to do from the beginning in terms of testing. But in the mid 19th century, there was a major change in how examinations were administered. Boston students now took written examinations rather than oral ones. And this is a very important turning point in a lot of, of this uh, uh, early education. Information about Boston's testing procedures encouraged other large cities to use written examinations. So we're going to shift now to the 1900 to 1960. Major changes are occurring in the characteristics of American society and public schooling in the first six decades of the, of the 20th century, and this has an impact on the, our uh, grading practices in elementary and secondary schools. The U.S. population grew, and the proportion of people living in urban areas increased substantially, and this is very important. The total number of public school districts dropped by two-thirds from 1932 to 1960. We have a forced consolidation of schools in, in, in areas because experts said that this was better. And the total number of one-teacher public schools dropped by 90% from 1916 to 1960. We have forgotten how far we have come in terms of, of our school organizations. States gradually created education departments and governors became more involved with schooling issues. This is a very late development actually in, in our history. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, towns and cities could not collect sufficient uh, school property taxes. There was a, just a problem of, 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 of raising money. State governments, which had other revenue op options, now increased their share of contributions to local schools and became more directly involved. But this was gradual. People left the local areas to make the decisions and gradually then those who contributed money exerted more control. Other major changes were the growing influence of the business community in the early 20th century and the introduction of scientific school management. Uh, Lewis Terminer, for example, publishes Stanford Binet IQ tests 
and the use of intelligence tests in schools grew rapidly in the 1920s. We have forgotten how important that early decades of the 20th century really is. Enrollments rose rapidly and student diversity increased due to post-war European immigration, which is something very similar to what we're going on today. Enrollments rose rapidly, student diversity increased, and schools became more complex. You have special schools, you have more uh, uh, careers being taught in schools, so the whole thing is becoming more complex as we go on. This encouraged educators to provide alternatives, including tracking students within schools. And as a result, it became important to schools, how do you decide how to track or how to promote students? Many testing experts and educators claimed that intelligent tests provided a more rational system for grouping students than relying on judgments of teachers. But teachers became very frustrated by the difficulty of reducing the number of students repeating the same grade or dropping out of school temporarily. And part of this is in economics. It costs additional monies uh, uh, to, to do so. So we begin to get automatic promotion coming in in the 1940s. By the early 40s and 50s, many major school systems had adopted some version of social promotion, particularly in the elementary schools. Turning to uh, the period 1960 to 2016, the proportion of the foreign-born population is growing to 14%. With today, with most immigrants coming from Asia or Latin America rather than Europe, as had been the case earlier. Spending on K-12 education in constant dollars has grown substantially. During the same period, the federal government and states increased the amount of money they're contributing to local education, and local areas are proportionately spending less money uh, uh, of, uh, in, in terms of their share. The average cost per pupil in public elementary and secondary schools more than triples, and the average annual salaries for elementary and secondary public school teachers increases by about 40%. So we're putting more money into education in many ways. And again, the question is for all of us, how well is it spent? How well could we improve upon that? One of the first major federal programs for public K-12 schools was the passage of the Smith-Hughes Vocational Educational Act, 1918. Very important because the federal government begins to fund staff at the, at, at the teaching level and at the Department of Education level. Later, the federal government passes the GI Bill of, uh, for veterans, uh, which also provides for those who are going to high school. Uh, and the National Defense Act of 58, which provided funds for foreign languages, mathematics, and s science instructions. So all the federal government material starts coming in slowly and gradually and unplanned. The 1960s was especially concerned about eliminating poverty and supporting the civil rights movement. This period also uh, witnessed increased federal involvement in preschool as well as elementary and secondary education. The complex history of NAEP is being discussed uh, later today, and so I'm not going to repeat myself uh, as I do in the paper. Uh, that will be discussed later. Congress passed the Economic Opportunity Act of 64 as part of President Johnson's War on Poverty. Under the legislation, the federal government launched an eight-week summer Head Start preschool program in 65 to prepare a half million child, disadvantaged children to enter the public schools. And this is one of the more promising programs that we had. Head Start is certainly one of the most popular federal programs we have ever uh, 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 talked about. But the problem is that the long-term effectiveness uh, of that uh, program and the oversight of the quality of the Head Start programs has not been a, a great success. 
The other major federal program for disadvantaged students was Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Besides providing funding for students, which is its main purpose, the decision was made to give money to the states to hire staff to run their programs. So the states are now gaining power at the same time the federal government is. During the 1970s and 1980s, concerns about the low economic productivity persuaded many governors, especially from the South, to take the lead in education reforms. Before 1960, low stakes testing was a normal part of elementary and secondary education. This was well established. In the 1970s, many states instituted minimum competency testing, including some which required tests for graduation purposes. The shift from using tests for information to holding students or educators uh, directly accountable for scores is probably the single most important change in testing in the past half a century, according to many scholars. President George H.W. Bush was differentiating himself from uh, Reagan and acknowledged the federal role in education and met together with the governors uh, of all of the states at the Charlottesville Education Summit in 1989. The outcome was an agreement to establish six, six overly ambitious national education goals which were to be raised, uh, uh, reached by the year 2000. So this is the beginning of our modern uh, uh, system. The Bush administration proposed the America 2000 program, but partisan differences prevented its congressional uh, passage, but it, parts of it were put into effect. President Clinton incorporated many of America 2000 ideas when Goals 2000 was enacted in 1993. They're very close in many ways. But again, partisan divisions over the proposed opportunity to learn standards uh, uh, really made any further uh, agreements among political parties difficult, if not impossible. By the mid-1990s, the Clinton administration and others quietly downplayed Goals 2000 and instead emphasized subjects such as reading, math, and science, as well as smaller federal education initiatives, and particularly the issue of systemic reforms, which the Clinton administration pushed. With the election of President George W. Bush in 2000, much of the basic framework of the previous America 2000 and Goals 2000 uh, was continued, but now many Republicans and even some Democrats wanted stronger standards and wanted to hold states and teachers even more accountable in practice. The federal government is very good about coming up with ideas and laws. Putting them in practice is very unusual, actually. And, and so we get the No Child Left Behind program. Following the limited success of both Goals 2000 and No Child Left Behind in reaching the national goals or even of making much progress, many analysts expected President Obama would abandon the No Child Left Behind approach. Obama did turn to other reform strategies such as the race to the top, but he also endorsed No Child Left Behind. Again, there was only limited progress toward the national goals during these years. Finally, in 2015, both Democrats and Republicans passed ESSA, which maintained aspects of the earlier initiatives, but are returning more power back to the states. And that's what we're facing today. Daniel Koretz, one of the more objective and competent testing experts, for example, favors appropriate uh, limited education of testing, but he argues that missing, uh, using uh, narrow high stakes tests and warns about the lack of attention. His summary of, of recent uh, uh, progress or lack of progress is, quote, it is an exaggeration to say that the costs of test-based accountability have been huge. <laughs> 
Instructions have been corrupted on a broad scale. Large amounts of instructional time are now siphoned off into test prep activities that at best waste time and at worst defraud students and their parents. Cheating has become widespread and the public has been deceived into thinking that achievement has dramatically improved and, and that the achievement gaps have been narrowed. He goes on, the primary benefits we received in return for all of this was substantial gains, gains in elementary school math that don't persist until graduation. This is true despite the fact that many variants of test-based accountability the reformers have tried. There is nothing on the horizon now that suggests that the net effects will be much better in the future. So this is a very sobering, but a very balanced uh, 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 statement. Now, my essay is really uh, dealing with this issue of, uh, of the history of, of, of what's going on. But, but there are things that really are, are, are also needed to be done, and I go on to talk about the, the issue of uh, uh, educa education, uh, research being needed, uh, that we need to do much more with early childhood education, that we really need to think about the immigrants that are coming in and that need the socialization to become citizens in, in our society. And finally, I also talk about the need to do bipartisan work. Without bipartisan work, we may be doomed in terms of this steady increase in, in real dollars funding that we need to have high quality education. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation and for Maris for, uh, for the paper here. Um, just a, a quick note about, about my uh, perspective on this. Although I'm not uh, a, a historian by training, I'm a, I'm a political scientist who uses historical evidence to make, chain, uh, to make arguments about changes in governance uh, and the politics of schooling and how that links to our capacity to make and implement policy. Um, so I clearly satisfy the AAPS mandate for full employment of political scientists by ensuring <laughs> that at least one be included in every issue of the uh, annals. Um, and I note there's only one here, so we have some progress uh, to, to, to be made on this issue. Okay. I also I can talk about history, okay? um, so I have that going for me. Okay. So uh, as Maris mentions, uh, this paper seeks to provide a chronology of the major developments in educational testing over a 400 year period. Uh, and we can all recognize that's, that's a big task, okay? That's a, that's a, a large uh, lift for all this, okay? I wanna, I wanna focus on three dimensions uh, of the paper. Um, uh, first, I wanna talk about some of the, uh, so make some comments on thematic uh, and narrative focus uh, of the piece. Um, I also have a comment on, on the paper's conceptualizing uh, uh, of how testing is used and changes in the use of testing, particularly over the last 30 years. Um, uh, and then third, uh, I have some thoughts on the relative depth of coverage of some issues relative to other issues. Um, so the, the relative weight of, of the, uh, uh, both the narrative and the empirical evidence in, in the piece, right? So first, first on the thematic and narrative focus. Um, I think there's a big tension uh, in this paper over whether the article seeks to provide a history of schooling or, or a history of testing. Uh, he starts talking, as he mentioned in his comments, um, he wants to provide a little context for, for uh, uh, testing. Um, but, it, it, and obviously the history of schooling is, is, is clearly related uh, uh, to the history of testing. Um, but much of the narrative is really is devoted to the development of schooling, demographic changes in schooling. But there's less light on the major developments within the testing regimes in use within the United States over, uh, over the last 100 years in particular. So in others, we get a lot on schooling and testing's along for the ride. But testing isn't really driving the car here uh, in this account, okay? Um, I think related to that uh, issue, and this is again sort of keeping in the, 
thematic and narrative focus comments, right? The periodization that the, that the article adopts, um, uh, I think is, is a bit problematic. So we have mid-1600s to 1900s, which is only a, a, a small chunk of the paper, uh, and then 1900 to 1960, uh, and then 1960 to 2016. And that may more or less align with some of the institutional organizational changes uh, in the development of schooling, uh, but I think there's a different periodization that helps us surface the ways that testing apart from organizational shifts in schooling, has developed over that time period, particularly the 20th century, right? Um, and that, that different periodization into the regimes of testing have emerged largely because of changes in social science, changes in basic math and statistics, uh, and changes in technology. So all of those changes run separate from the development of, of, of education uh, or schooling uh, organizationally. Um, uh, and so those three changes themselves uh, give us a different set of time periods when different testing regimes are emergent or predominant. Uh, and to be honest, I think much of the piece should probably focus on changes over, over the 20th century. Okay? Um, the second point I, I want to make is I think the piece needs to be uh, a bit more open to changes in the uses of testing, how tests are used. Um, uh, the periodization question can help us clarify the different mo modalities of assessment, uh, which, which he does talk about. Um, but there have been other and deeply important changes in how tests have been used. The purposes of testing uh, uh, have changed over time, and that has enormous policy and political implications. Um, just, just to pick one, the standards and accountability movement changed the ambitions of testing. Okay? Uh, it made testing a key element of governance. Uh, through the policy consequences that might fall on students, teachers, principals, schools, school districts uh, for not meeting those assessment goals. Um, and that story needs to be told because it's a key change in how tests are woven through other institutions. Um, pl places that didn't used to pay attention to tests now have to, uh, and that's a change in, in governance. Um, and so testing has those radiating effects through other uh, elements of, of our political life that are separate from the classroom. Um, and we can talk about what those changes in the uses of testing have been and sort of document those. So uh, progression from testing as sorting, testing as showing mastery, testing as a governance mechanism, to testing as a means for improving instruction. And I think the other papers in this uh, uh, volume are going to hit on those, those pieces, um, but I think uh, it would be useful if Maris sort of flagged those. And that those changes and those shifts and that evolution um, have promoted political fights and academic fights. Okay, and I think um, uh, you, have a, you have a couple of comments about courts, and, and you may characterize courts one way. I don't know if everyone in the room would char characterize courts that way. Um, even as my own sympathies might lie in, in one dimension of that, I think to characterize the debate uh, may be uh, unfair to courts. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's in a bigger fight, okay? um, and I think that's, that's, an, that's an important point to note. Um, also, I think uh, testing and the changes of testing, and this is, this is, this is something, so I geek out in political science land here, right? So political scientists, part of us, what we concern, we think about state building, and standardization is a really key part of state building, um, and testing and the changes of testing have made the standardization of schooling in the U.S. possible despite demographic, cultural, ethnic, geographic, and linguistic diversity um, in a way that was never possible before. So we, we have increasingly standardized schooling only because testing as a technology and as a political practice has, uh, has emerged. Uh, and so we need to be open to that, uh, the consequences of that, of that standardization. Um, the third point is about relative coverage and things that uh, need to be included um, uh, and things that, that may, may not need, need to be included. Uh, there are a couple, that I just kind of want to hit three things that I think really should be here that uh, are not. Uh, and the first is really, uh, I, I think the effects of World War II um, in particular are, are huge, both on the capacity to test and the uses of testing within uh, uh, public schools in the post-war era. Uh, the emphasis that World War II placed on the efficient uses of manpower um, drove the development of a whole capacity to test at scale, uh, which was begun in World War I. Uh, but then there's been also, because of World War II, a huge growth in computing power uh, to actually under, undertake large-scale mass assessments. Uh, and, and that's a huge and significant development in the history of testing. Um, second, and I think 
given all Maris's previous work, I, I'm sort of, I, was, I think, and this isn't a hard thing to do, I think, uh, there's no mention here of the Coleman Report. Um, the Coleman Report, I think, <clears throat> uh, 66, it's a really important, it comes at a very important time, both in the development of technologies of testing, but also in the political shifts. As the federal government's giving more money, the Coleman Report is showing uh, schools don't do what we think they do, um, so why should we give more money? Uh, and also, there were increasing political backlashes against wastes of federal funds right at that time in the 66, 66 period. Um, and so the Coleman report really created a political problem that only more testing could answer or address. And so that's a that's an example, I think, of where um, uh, I think that the, the, the periodization of testing is different than the periodization of schooling. Um, and I think also, and Michael Nettles, the papers talked about this in, 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 I think, a really useful way, so maybe it's not as important to be in uh, uh, this paper, uh, but there's not as much attention to the private sector and the rise of the testing industry, uh, which is an important player here in all this. Um, I think there should be some attention to the supply side and the political economy of testing uh, that, that should be in here. Um, Nettles' paper really focuses on higher education, and there's a whole other story about how K through 12, you know, my own, my own experiences on the I would test of basic skills were deeply traumatic. So, um, so I, you know, clearly that's got to be the front and center piece on all this here. Um, I have additional cuts, or additional suggestions for cuts and applications, but I'll, I'll leave those to the, the written comments for Maris later. Thanks. I know there are probably going to be questions, discussions. Oh. Yeah, I think that's how it's on the so on the calendar. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, um, Michael and and Jim and Amy. Um, everybody was involved in convening this uh, and conceiving of this idea. Uh, when I was first invited. Uh, to uh, think about this and work on it. I was in a very different mindset than I am today, but I want to appreciate, uh, express my appreciation today for having gotten into this. Um, the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was a very difficult thing to uh, try to traverse and then to, uh, with all the regard that I have for Maris, and the work that he did for us on the National Academy, I mean, the National Assessment Governing Board, uh, developing our history. Uh, it was a different kind of excitement uh, to be uh, thinking about the post-secondary version of what he would do with uh, K through 12. Uh, I've often imagined, uh, tried, tried to think about the history of higher education, but not alongside the history of testing and of people uh, during uh, these various periods. Uh, so if you, you know, I've, I've always imagined uh, Harvard College in 1636, what that must have been like uh, attending college. It had a, um, a European settler as its head and successive presidents uh, uh, up through the years. Uh, growth in higher education in the U.S. exceeded the growth in European uh, higher education and has ever since. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, uh, the history that we have in higher education. The history of testing is no less remarkable um, in higher education. Uh, there are key figures that I point out in this paper, and we could have thought about many more but the three key figures that I elected to think about here was uh, Charles William Elliott, Nicholas Murray Butler, and um, to a lesser extent, uh, Wilson Ferran. Uh, their K through 12 uh, advocate. They needed somebody to bring along um, K through 12 as they were trying to develop uh, standardized assessment in higher education. I, I date the uh, origin of higher education admissions testing to Charles Elliott's inauguration address in 1869. 
uh, two, two aspects of Butler and, and Elliott that are key to almost anything that happens in higher education because it takes so long. Um, and there's always a lot of controversy uh, along the way is longevity. Both of them served in their positions for over 40 years, uh, which proved to be really important because uh, in the case of Elliot, even though he talked about the importance of having a standardized assessment in 1869, it wasn't until 1900 that he and Butler and Ferran were able to, able to persuade their um, contemporaries of, um, of the need to establish the College Entrance Examination Board and have a standardized test. So if you were thinking about assessment in higher education uh, uh, and, and Jack Buckley's uh, book uh, earlier this year uh, makes it, you know, gives a nice history of, 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 the, uh, of the SAT and college admissions testing uh, by the college board. Um, and there are several other histories that are really important. I actually went through um, to the University Archives at Harvard. It's a huge library, of course, and but you know they called the University Archives the um, the place where Harvard faculty and administrators' history lies. So that's how you distinguish the University Archives. Many of these uh, places have named uh, are named for their uh, contributors, their donors. The University Archives has uh, some interesting data about African Americans, for example, who were entering Harvard. Um, Richard Greener, who graduated just a year after um, uh, Elliot was inaugurated into office, um, is you know was an interesting figure for a very long time. He eventually became dean of law school at, Har at Howard University. Uh, Alan Locke, the first Rhodes Scholar, uh, entered Harvard the same year that Elliot gave a speech on behalf of Hampton Institute, in which he pointed out that Southerners were no more uh, racially uh, 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 prejudiced and, uh, against African Americans than Northerners. He, he made this very clear. It's very interesting to read some of the speeches uh, by Eliot uh, during that period of time. Of course, Alan Locke came from this city, graduated from Central High School, second in his class, entered Harvard and became the first African-American Rhodes Scholar. Uh, graduated a year early. I'm not sure why, uh, but it, it, the, the history of his experience as a Rhodes Scholar was not one that would that we would like to relive. I mean, it was a very difficult experience for him. There wasn't another African-American Rhodes Scholar uh, for 60 years. Uh, so, and he became uh, dean at Howard as well. And it begins to show you the differences. I tried to find uh, out in the case of Greener and their contemporaries, what their admissions testing experience was. Uh, and to this point, this is not to be found. I mean, I, I didn't even need to know scores. I just wanted to know if they experienced uh, and what it was, uh, how they presented themselves to the admissions committees of these institutions. And it was very uneven how people did that. Uh, letters of recommendation were very important. Um, but the influence that Butler and Elliot had on higher education is remarkable. I mean, the things that we have, like the elective systems and the way colleges and universities are organized, um, much of that can be dated back to these people. There was a key meeting in Trenton, <laughs> New Jersey. Most people don't think of Trenton as being, uh, you know, the the place where much happens anymore. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it was it was a pivotal meeting in Prince in Trenton where. Elliot traveled by train, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm trying to think, well, what was a train ride like from Boston to uh, Trenton in those days uh, on a steam train? Uh, you know, uh, and, and 
And it was pivotal because that was where the decision was made to establish the College Entrance Examinations Board. Now, if you go out on the web, uh, Wilson Ferran was the head of uh, Newark Academy. If you go out on the web and you look for people who are blogging about assessment, keeping a running tally about assessment, there's a math teacher at Newark Academy these days. I think his name is Jacobson. I cite him in the paper here um, uh, that, you know, keeps a running track and uh, he has a sort of an angle about and a, and a perspective about all of this. Now, there were, uh, there are many acts that have been passed, uh, public policies that have been passed in higher education. But I don't think, I think the monumental ones are probably, uh, you can count on one hand. Uh, the first one was the Morrell Act of 62, 1862, uh, which was defeated before it was passed, like everything else. And then the 1890 Land Grant Act, which basically launched the southern part of the uh, the land grant institutions. It was, a, you know, they had to come along. Decisions had to be made about how African Americans would be accommodated. Um, and so you've got Southern and HBCUs established in 1890. Plessy versus Ferguson became a very instrumental uh, law of, uh, you know, reinforcing segregation. You can go back to Elliott's hometown, Boston, to find the first desegregation case, uh, which occurred the same year that he graduated from high school. So here you were, you had African Americans fighting, struggling to try to get into Boston Latin or you know, what would have been considered quality institutions. And, and Elliot graduating and then people being told that they can't go. Uh, and, you know, and can't have access to that kind of quality. So when I start thinking about today's gaps in achievement, I think about that history, uh, how long it took for Plessy versus Ferguson to be uh, righted um, in history. The court cases that began in the late 30s, 1930s, beginning uh, with the uh, Gaines, uh, Missouri case, uh, gaining admissions into uh, in institutions of higher education, and even after gaining admissions, being mistreated. Uh, and I think about all of that legacy, not to mention Brigham and the IQ testing. A lot of these tests were established in the, in a, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the MCAT, the LSAT, the um, GRE, uh, and they've grown ever since. And it's an interesting history how advanced placement was established and how uh, some of these early assessment uh, decisions uh, uh, test had an influence on things like immigration policy uh, and sort of the exclusionary history uh, involved in all of this. Of course, the Roosevelt uh, GI Bill represents another huge uh, policy in higher education, so you got the Morrell Land Grant Act, and now you go up to the uh, GI Bill, and then you look at Truman's um, commissions on higher education, where he established the first numerical goal for how big higher education would be. This was the the origin of community colleges, and while much of the focus in my effort was on admissions testing. We have to remember that a lot of testing in higher education involves placement testing, uh, also outcomes assessment these days, and placement testing is really important in community colleges. Um, those were the junior colleges in the 1960s. Every community got one uh, by 1962. We achieved the first goals that Truman set for post-secondary enrollment. Next big policy uh, was the um, Johnson Administration uh, Higher Ed Act. And I've got a chart here that shows that these, this act has been, um, you know, reauthorized uh, for umpteen number of times, uh, 68 and then 72 and so on. Uh, 
it's being considered, it's overdue for reauthorization today. Uh, but this is the greatest, I mean, this is the next big policy uh, action in higher education, and it's very difficult to find anything that competes with, uh, with those uh, acts. Now, <clears throat> I, I, ca I called this paper, uh, I, I highlight the controversies in testing because, and, I, and I'm at the point now of going back and thinking about the implications of what I've had to say in this history. Uh, there's much more work to be done. I mean, you could spend days in the archives trying to understand the complexities of the people. I mean, the fact that women's colleges, for example, were founded at the same time that HBCUs were, 1636 Mount, Mount Holyoke and Cheney State College right here in Pennsylvania were founded in that same year. And looking at their trajectories over time and how uh, the complexities of the people who were involved, women's colleges got involved in admissions testing uh, back in um, about 1914, even uh, participating on the governing boards of the, of the College Entrance Examination Board and so on. So there are complexities in institutions, how they develop, but there are also complexities in people and in public policy. So today, if I were to suggest uh, what needs to be done historically, and some of this has been attempted, but not in the context of trying to think about social justice or equity in uh, higher education. What does it look like historically? What do, what do items look like, test items? Look like uh, from 1900 to uh, 2018. Uh, there's a big difference, uh, but has anybody taken an analytical look at what effect it has on people who are actually taking uh, these assessments. Now we've got different, a different composition of society and people who are uh, taking these tests. How are they constructed differently? How does the past inform the present? Now, one challenge that we have in higher education assessment, especially admissions testing, is that given its historical legacy of exclusion, racism, uh, inequity, uh, even the people, I mean, when you look at some of these people who were involved in developing these initial assessments and their intention, uh, their intentions, uh, we can change the name. We can change it from the scholastic aptitude test to the scholastic achievement test. We can change uh, the content. But it's still there. I mean, some, somehow, uh, will we be able, going forward, to make a break with that past? Can we make uh, a separation between uh, the history of assessment and where we need to go as a society? Now, Eliot made the point in his 2004 speech, the problem uh, or the Negro problem is what it was called. Um, he made the point that this would take generations. Uh, he pointed out that white people uh, didn't emerge to where they were collectively uh, for many years, uh, and that it would take many generations for people to do. And I wonder if, in fact, uh, we're trying to uh, measure the correct things in the, in the correct ways. This is, represents a challenge for us, and that's the, that's the last uh, part of this paper uh, that I will try to develop as I go forward. I want to thank uh, Mike and Jim for inviting me to participate in this way, and I look forward to the conversation that we're going to have over the next day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
first I'll declare that I'm a sociologist, neither historian nor a uh, <coughs> psychometrician. Uh, but as a sociologist, and thanks to a dear friend that both Michael and I had, um, who is deceased now, um, William Taylor uh, found some of my work and decided to invite me into the world of litigation to assist in securing greater opportunities of access for students of color. And uh, <clears throat> that began my venture into trying to understand the role and function of testing, particularly as a barrier to access for so many students of color. So my comments today in response to uh, Michael's paper, uh, I, I, <laughs> I just chose to change the uh, opening comment. I'm struck by a kind of normative sense in which we are not acknowledging the prevailing theoretical models that guided most of our thinking during each of these eras. And I began to think about this last evening because early on in our intellectual history in this country in terms of explaining status attainment, which is the prevailing model of statistical prediction about adult outcomes that I entered into Chapel Hill with in 1975. But the prevailing theoretical models were largely functionalist. They were consistent with notions of human capital theory. And, and the reason why I raise that is because in each of these different areas, so we've moved now to where we have something called critical race theory. In the interim, we've had conflict theory, which challenged many of the assumptions of structural functionalist theory. But it's also important to realize that those were not theories that were just laying around anywhere. Talca Parsons was at Harvard. Daniel Patrick Moynihan was at Harvard, and in 1972 wrote that critical essay on higher education access to, not an essay, it was a newspaper article, memo. Now it's time for a little benign neglect. And it was in reference to the number of African Americans we had enrolled in higher education in 1972 compared to higher education enrollment in Europe. So I think it's very important for us to understand that political context because in so many ways, either consciously or, um, or not, our assessments have been in some sense in service to these larger concerns to these dominating, overarching pieces. So, <clears throat> as Talcott Parsons' article in, I think, I think it's 1951, it argues for the importance of um, sorting and selecting as a primary function of schooling. Testing and use of sorting and selecting in the context of a changing demographic in the U.S. had necessarily to play a disadvantaging role for members of my community. Because it was also about determining access to critical outcomes in terms of employment, in terms of other kinds of opportunities. And as we see today, we continue to fight for, uh, for access to those preferred and desirable outcomes. So I wanted to put that out first because uh, m some of my comments and some of the examples I'll use hopefully will clarify uh, some of that. So uh, with that in mind, I want next to commend Michael for his careful reading of the history of assessment as it uh, has been used in influencing and shaping access to higher education. So I, I will not, I will try to make clear the notion that there is some decontextualization that I think this volume could do a lot to address by placing assessment in that larger context. So uh, the Coleman Report would be one example. 
The prevailing conventional wisdom in the Coleman Report was that poverty was the dominant factor in differentiating the schools attended by blacks and whites. But the findings of that report, even though there are reasons to question the um, measurement practices in there, but it went through to identify the resource differences between the two sets of schools. Well, if all you're doing is identifying the presence or absence of those resources, schools aren't going to look very different. There's not going to be a whole heck of a lot of variance attributed to whether a school had a chemistry lab. There's a tremendous difference between what was in the chemistry lab. So if you were in a chemistry lab where there was one Bunsen burner, you got to watch the instructor do the experiment. If you were in a different school where there was one for each of you and some leftovers in the closet, everybody got to do it. Those are different learning experiences. So, <clears throat> but the finding then that poverty in and of itself was not necessarily the prevailing cause of the disparities we were watching in educational outcomes, I think was an eye opener to the complexity of this issue. So Michael's attention to that aspect in thinking about the century of controversy, I think could be um, fleshed out a bit with uh, attention to some of that. I think it's important to recognize <clears throat> Um, that these theoretical models that prevailed at the time uh, still shape much of what, I was, uh, what our thinking does. I want to point to one additional model uh, that also strikes at the theoretical notion I'm making. Um, the late Alan Kirchhoff, a sociologist whose specialty was the sociology of education, um, turn to allocation theory in an effort to try and explain the patterns of school performance that so negatively impacted African American children and was so consequential for status attainment. Uh, in, the 19, in this 1972 article, the abstract says, uh, a review presented in the research which has led to the construction of elaborated models of status attainment, noting that major theoretical thrust into this work has followed a socialization perspective. So we have so many discussions of the inadequate, inappropriate socialization of black children and other children of color and poor children, so that their aspirations were misaligned, only to find out in the first national longitudinal survey of high school students in LL72, when we begin to compare the aspirations of African American students with their peers, their aspirations were actually higher. So then we had to come up with an alternative explanation. But clearly, these challenge some of our assumptions about what's at work here. So what Kirchhoff argued was that it is suggested there are both theoretical and empirical grounds for including in such investigation, indices of the effects of allocation as well as socialization. The idea of allocation is that there are adult authorities who have the responsibility and authority for making critical decisions about children's future. And what they can do with those decisions is to situate students into different learning experiences. Um, and they go on in a subsequent piece to use disciplinary encounters to demonstrate the effect of these allocated decisions that educators make. It's a very powerful piece in that sense because it redirects our attention to other practices that are shaping the experiences of these um, students and thereby the outcomes. So I wanted to encourage us to think of that larger context as we are building this uh, volume. I also want to encourage the inclusion of the discussion of uh, Dick Lehman's work in this particular 
chapter. The big test is important because of what we can see as its allocative consequences. Like discipline, it is also often treated as irredeemable, that it cannot be easily or effectively improved. Like discipline, it also appears to have a moral quality to it in that it brands the poor test scorer or somehow uh, less, as somehow less entitled to humane and just treatment. Labels and the label sticks. In educational testing, it's been pretty powerful. For the successful test taker, the high performer, it has been a recurring gift. Um, I think the volume, the mismeasurement of man needs to be a part of this chapter, as do the volumes from neurons to neighborhoods, an NRC publication, and of course, my introduction to many of you, the high stakes volume, testing for tracking placement and special education. Uh, ability grouping and high school graduation, which is the last part of that. Each of these books, in their own way, present the science that allows us to respond to the misappropriation of assessments that are resulting in allocative practices that dramatically and perhaps too often permanently reposition students for failure due to less or inadequate education. So <clears throat> I think it is important again, just repeating myself, to revisit the prevailing social science theory across the past century, because these have played a part in, for instance, current demands for uh, increased access. I think we need to also discuss, and I think the chapter builds towards that, Michael, in sort of the massification of higher education. Both in Clinton and in Obama, we have a movement from mass high, uh, K-12 education to mass higher education. I think I'm being signal, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, quickly let me just say then, this chapter is a welcomed and worthy addition to the conversation on how standardized testing has failed minority populations. I think visiting the scholarship of James Anderson, my good friend and close colleague, and Chris Spann, both historians of education, would pay uh, big dividends to this volume, primarily because they both, in different, um, using different eras, demonstrate how persistent these communities of color have been in advocating for and persisting for greater access, greater participation in education, especially in higher education. Thank you. hour on the history of, on some aspects of the history of educational testing in American education. I, I'm reminded of the time when, um, I think it was Woody Allen who took the Evelyn Wood speed reading course. <laughs> and he said he had just finished War and Peace in 15 minutes. And when he was asked what he remembers of it, he said, Russia. <laughs> um, so uh, this effort to try to <laughs> consolidate uh, the history of American education into an hour's worth of contemplation, and in particular with respect to testing. I think we're getting a little bit more than just Russia, but uh, it is quite a challenge. So I want to thank our authors and discussants for uh, helping us with that. My own summary of this is, again, to remember that if there are maybe three overwhelming and overarching aspects of the American educational historical experience that relate to this, I would summarize them as one, the, um, the republic's founding and the, and the ideals of essentially a democracy that's based on diffusion and what the, uh, the former president of Harvard once referred to as the great hodgepodge of American education. And that's what I think I'm getting a little bit in Maris's paper about the history of how we have confronted the challenges of state and local and national efforts to bring some coherence to this hodgepodge. But that remains, I think, one of the most important contextual constraints or opportunities when it, when it comes to educational testing is to, is to think of that. The second um, 
is, of course, the, the commitment to mass public education. And here, I know that both of these papers have talked about this uh, topic. And uh, the evidence on that is, at least for me, pretty clear that um, we were, uh, I believe, the first country, the first industrialized country, democracy, to uh, invent this idea of compulsory schooling. If you look at the data on, for example, 19, early 1950s participation in, uh, in traditional post, uh, uh, elementary and secondary education, high school in particular, uh, we were already up in the high 70s in terms of the percent participating, and in most of the other um, industrialized democracies at the time, England, Denmark, France, Germany, and all that, the numbers were in the low teens. So we have this overwhelming sort of uh, commitment to mass public education, which I believe is partly why we were willing and able to embrace a system of educational measurement that had some uh, appeal from the standpoint of, of uh, the efficiency side of understanding how we were doing. And of course, the third thing which comes up in both of these uh, papers, I think, in very, with, with, with great emphasis and significance, is the ongoing American struggle with race. And uh, one cannot, I believe, get into a discussion about educational testing in the United States without consciously, explicitly, and directly confronting the ongoing struggle of racial discrimination and now continuing evidence of inequality in spite of uh, the efforts that have been made. So that's my, um, that's, that's my footnote to the Woody Allen summary of War and Peace. It's my way of un trying to bring some of this together. Let's have a broader discussion. We have some time, and uh, what, what did I just do wrong here? I spilled water on something, so I... Oh, there's a microphone here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good. Comments, questions, uh, Henry Brown. There's a microphone on its way to you. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, I appreciated both uh, presenters and their commentators. A couple of thoughts on Michael's uh, hi, Michael uh, presentation. Uh, given the Harvard theme, it seems strange that you don't include James Bryant Conant in your uh, set of uh, elected uh, stars in the uh, assessment firmament. So I thought it might be worth uh, giving him some mention. Secondly, uh, it seems to me, and again, of course, I haven't read your paper, but I wonder if you have some discussion of the role of faculty assessment. That is, most assessment in higher education goes on at the classroom level. Faculty make up tests, different kinds. How has faculty-driven assessment changed over, the, say, the last 100 years, and to what extent has it been affected by technology? So, for example, the development of these uh, readers that can deal with multiple choice marks really change the efficiency of testing in, in many important ways. How has that affected classroom testing? And what are the implications of that for instruction? So it seems to me that's another area that might be worth uh, uh, discussing. The third area that strikes me as important is the, the uh, increasing interest, at least among administrators, of introducing standardized assessments for higher education outcomes. So both ETS and ACT and other organizations have higher ed outcomes assessments, which are typically violently opposed by faculty. And there have been a number of uh, developments around the AAC and U and so on of trying to encourage faculty to develop higher quality assessments on their own. And there is an interesting struggle there, I think, uh, between standardization versus faculty-driven assessment that I, I think is going to become increasingly important uh, around higher education accountability. So, just suggest those are things that might be worth including somehow in your chapter. Thank you. Do you want to um, take that on? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Henry, for the good questions. And, and on the last one on outcomes assessment and faculty-driven assessment, I will leave those as just great questions to ponder. 
yeah, the, the limitation of, of time was one aspect of this a uh, couple months. Uh, another was uh, the limit, the word limit, <laughs> the word count on this, uh, which is 7,500 words, I think, or something, and I'm, I'm still over. Uh, but on Conan, um, what, what I think is included in this paper, perhaps, or I hope you didn't get the cutting room, is that in, in 1932 he made a huge contribution to admissions testing by asking Henry Chauncey, actually, to go find a test that would allow him to select people from Oklahoma, I mean, or, or you know, the rest of the country for scholarships. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, sort of, and, and Chauncey came back and suggested the SAT, which was then about seven years old, I guess, or so. Um, so, uh, but, but thank you for your questions, and, and those, are, those are important areas to think about, but uh, none of these areas is as, is as controversial as admissions testing. Outcomes assessment is evolving, and we have a lot of work to do to, to help it along, but uh, historically speaking, it's an infant. Rick. Heinrich. Um, Maris, I liked your broad view of what had happened over 400 years. The one, th two things that struck me that you didn't mention, they might be in the paper, uh, that I think are the most significant changes in the last X years are Education for All Handicapped Act and Special Ed and uh, Brown versus Board of Education and the subsequent legal battles, all of which, both of which seem to interact very closely with testing and accountability and other things? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I mentioned briefly, in, literally in a paragraph, the, uh, the Brown decision. Uh, the problem with all of this is when you're doing what we're doing, even if you focus on the last hundred years, you're basically showing people there is something that's worth looking at and making a citation to it. On the handicapped, I deliberately didn't uh, add to it, but there's a whole paper uh, with us, and, and that's one of the things that I think will help a lot because as you focus down on, say, post-60s or something, which most of these things are, those papers are gonna have to carry that. The difficulty is, is, is the number of words. The, my paper was actually a third longer, which I cut. Uh, and what Doug raised, uh, those are all good questions. Now, where do you put your emphasis? And my feeling is actually, understanding the context which we come from is very important because those battles are ongoing and if anything, they're gonna get more interesting. <laughs> I think Mike. Uh, yeah, I, 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 on this I would just like to add a point on these court cases. Um, I, I worked my way through a few days on this paper into frustration about trying to figure out uh, where the courts stood on testing uh, in higher education. So I wrote a friend uh, who is a professor at University of Arkansas Law School, Mark Killenbeck, and he wrote me a long memo, and I attribute. Uh, give him attribution in the paper, I cite him. He says that in, in the case of higher education, the courts have taken the position of deference, uh, judicial deference, which my interpretation is that they, and, and, and then I went back and read these cases and he's absolutely right. What they basically say is that we're not experts in deciding about what you do in the admissions process. So we just gonna allow you to choose whichever test you want to, we're not gonna act on that, and so on and so forth. And so uh, I wonder if it's the same Maris in K through 12. I, I hadn't spent any time thinking about that. Uh, well, Bill may have an answer to that. Yeah. I don't know that it's a, an answer to it, but one of the, one of the uh, passages I read references how the courts have consistently said uh, those are patterns of disadvantage that are society that have societal causes and as such the court will not address societal causes 
societal remedy. And so I think to the extent that we are caught in a situation where our science has not rendered these things more humanely uh, caused, humanly caused, we're going to be trapped in an argument of not having redress for some of the most persisting and deeply embedded sources of disadvantage. It's not a pleasant answer, but I think that's where the courts have been for some time. Jim? I, um, I really appreciate what <clears throat> uh, you folks have, have tried to cover and also you know, re re respect the fact that you're working within certain limits. I want to go back to, I think, Michael, you mentioned this, and, and it's probably not something you can deal with in your papers on the history, but needs to be brought out somewhere in the chapters across this volume, and maybe it's in the later chapters. It has to do with something you said, Michael, which is what is being tested. And, and in fact, there's, you know, across this long span of time, if we just take the decade of the 20th century up to the present, we've not until recently really challenged the very nature of what these tests are composed of and the, their, their you know, validity with respect to the, the inferences we're making from them. And, and that's a piece of history that somehow needs to, to get discussed. Maybe it gets discussed as we think about the future. We reflect on what we have been doing in the past under all these different uses and guises of the use of assessments. But it is something that is worth alluding to, which is it just sort of sits there. The test just sits there, and it fundamentally hasn't changed all that much since the first SAT was designed and, and the first IQ tests. So I used the word splendor in uh, the opening part of this past, uh, paper to describe testing because I do think that it represents, I mean, the technology, the work that's gone into um, the testing production. But you can even look at the scoring aspects of tests and the development of rubrics and how people implement the scoring. And there are complexities that I wonder um, some days, I, you know, I, work, I wake up worrying about it sometimes, about what kind of decisions we're making and people. And it bothers me immensely, the exclusion I wonder if something different would have emerged had there been much more involvement of African Americans, for example, around the tables where these assessments are being developed. Uh, in the beginning, more women, for example. Uh, you know, so, so it's something that is unsettled in my mind. I just want to add to that is we start with the assumption here, I think, in some ways, that national testing, standardized testing, is the norm, and how do we get to the norm, and what are the deviations? I would argue, actually, it never has been. That it's been started out local, if, there, if the testing is there. To get to the state level, you're talking about very late history. Uh, and almost all of the legislation that ever passes always talks about voluntary testing. And in, in, in fact, there's so many different ways out of in the last 30 years. So the norm is probably diversity of testing and an embarrassment of, of techniques. They're not experimenting, what, how can we get the best test? They're dealing with their own problems. Systemic reform, that's what it was. I think we have time for one more question, comment, and then I'm gonna just ask if the, anybody on the panel wants to have a last word before we take our break. Bob Miss Levy. This is a comment. Um, our workshop is about educational assessment. Um, a lot of the problems that I see in conversations at policy level, public, are conflating the terms assessment and testing and measurement. And um, there, if you think of assessment as the broadest uh, term that goes everywhere from an informal conversation between a kid and a teacher. Um, it includes things that are testing. Measurement is a different kind of thing where it maps into a quantitative framework. But there are so many different use cases that 
practices that are wonderful and make sense in one are disastrous in another. And unless you sort that out, just talking about what is the history of testing, what should testing be or what assessment should be, um, you stay stuck in that morass and don't really work your way out until you start to have language that sorts those things out and how they differ. Yeah. Can, can I just add to that? Oftentimes ambiguity is built in because that's the way legislation works. Systemic reform is clear in the minds of one individual but not in the other. Throughout our history, we get things passed and done by making them diffuse. So I agree with you, that, but the likelihood of making it that concrete and that special is we need to point that out to people, but people talk past each other. Systemic reform is a great example of that. Well, let's go down the rest of the table then. Uh, yeah, I would uh, just sort of, um, the, the gulf between the, the science uh, and, and the politics is, is vast. Um, and so the way in which all of this gets, gets played out in either conversations or, or practices within schools, within households, within uh, school districts, um, I think uh, Maris's point is exactly right, is that the lack of, con uh, of clarity actually has political utility for a lot of folks. Um, and so you're, people want to hold on to that in order to achieve multiple and different objectives. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of a given to all of this. Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, I just, as my other hat is as a constitutional person. Um, so the court's question about how to engage uh, societal discrimination goes back to the state action, uh, 14th Amendment dimensions of, of the, the theory in which we brought all of this litigation around inequality is about what is the state done uh, in order to uh, uh, discriminate or, or, or uh, promote inequality. Um, uh, and that is a n very narrow slice onto the, the broader dimensions of, of the generation of inequality. So we have a very limited tool to address a much broader thing. Not that state action doesn't actually, right. uh, you know, the color of law book and all that uh, talks about this, but it, we have a very limited policy tool to try to address a much vaster problem. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Michael. So, so yeah, so this checkered history of uh, testing. So uh, Bob's question, uh, reminded me of historically how people used to go to the admissions committees and uh, have recitations of Greek and Latin uh, uh, to be admitted to these colleges. And one day I was uh, reading about all the these institutions and you have to remind yourself these were very small places at that time. I mean, they, the average size in 1890 was about 200 students or something like that. The largest institutions had 600. So you can make a whole lot out of, you know, a, a little bit in our present context. Where I came down was to try to distinguish between the, the point at which large scale assessment took on its beginning. And large scale in the very beginning years were like 900 students, it grew to 2000. There were financial challenges, there were a couple of, of uh, world wars over time. <laughs> and testing has just managed to go on. You know, it seems uh, that you could read about testing history without being my, reminded of the complexities in society over time, not, to, not just the racial issues. And I'll make one other comment. I think, um, you know, uh, war and peace is one thing. It, we have lots of world wars but, and other kinds of wars, but there was this in the 60s, and I think I kept it in my paper, uh, this whole um, discussion, public debate, where scholars tried to meet with media uh, to talk about genetics and biology and testing. Uh, Bill Trent's comment about Stephen Gould's uh, mismeasure of man reminded me of uh, that part of, of the paper. And uh, I was able not to spend a whole lot of time uh, talking about it because Lee Cronbach actually did a remarkable job of characterizing uh, that history. And 
I think we're still engaged in it to some degree, uh, but there have been lessons learned over, uh, over time about that. And, uh, you know, much of it is which, which is that we don't have enough uh, evidence to be able to draw any conclusions. These people were actually trying to, uh, to fudge or, you know, uh, to be ambiguous, actually, uh, and learned a valuable lesson from the media about it and from politicians that we couldn't actually, we weren't ready for prime time, so to speak, and, and maybe still haven't become uh, ready for prime time. But I think your points are well taken about the variation in the way we think about testing and assessment. Um, in this context, I, I would have to say we've been talking about large-scale standardized tests. Mm -hmm. Bill Trent, last uh, word. Just very brief. Uh, I think it's really important to understand those distinctions, and it, it should be made clear. In the state of Illinois, we have 893 school districts, 893. Some of the fudging we see is explicitly there or implicitly there to deal with centuries-old notions of states' rights, local control, local authority, and to be able to make those distinctions about whether we're testing to find the best employee for my emerging in industry or whether we're doing large-scale assessment. And so I think that's a very critical distinction to make but everywhere we have that kind of diversity. Last piece, I think this issue of states' rights has to be understood. There was one senator who prevented the passage of the um, Military Benefits Act until it allowed the states to have control over it. So at the 11th hour, he signed the legislation, but not until it was states' rights. That's what we see in terms of one of the sources of the disparities in access to opportunity in our 18 southern and border states. Okay, well, I'm, uh, first of all, uh, again, very grateful that we've had this chance to think about these issues together and there's plenty more to think about. I'm also reassured by noting that we are now uh, behind schedule. <laughs> And uh, but in a historical being sense, someone right who <laughs> appreciates history, I feel like there's some consistency in that. So I'm going to, uh, with the uh, approval of my uh, partners here, um, say that we will take a break now until 11.15 instead of 11. Because if we stuck to 11, you'd have 30 seconds. And that wouldn't <laughs> work very well. So let's regroup at 11.15, please, and uh, we'll continue. Thank you again to this first panel.